to had good rest last night. We begin with Professor Natsima, review of recent laboratory and numerical simulations of the The emphasis in this workshop is on mathematics. I really want to start with some experiments first. Because we've been doing both experiments and uh, computation side by side. And uh, in retrospect, I see that if we had not been making the experiments, we would not have made those computations. Because the experiments were crucial in uh, forming the ideas which inform or the models which we create. Or, uh, cloud flows. The subject is, I, I want to say it's cumulus flows. I still don't want to say clouds too easily because uh, uh, there's no water vapor in the experiment or in the model. Okay. Uh, it was driven by asking ourselves the following question. Uh, clouds have been classified by meteorologists well since uh, beginning with uh, the British chemist who made this uh, Toward Latin system. And uh, fluid dynamics, similarly, uh, in uh, turbulent shear flows, classify them to different types jets, wakes, plumes, and so on. And so, the first question you ask yourself if you come from a fluid dynamics background is what kind of animal is this cloud flow? Uh, the cumulus cloud is particularly a flow cloud, or at least that's the view here. It's a flow problem and it's a flow cloud. So, Actually, we've been doing this in, uh, for quite some time, and here is a list of all the people who work with me. Actually, this is not a complete list. This is only a list of the people whose work uh, done with me I'm going to mention today. I started with uh, Professor G.S. Bhatt, um, Professor Kya Srinivas, my colleague at uh, JNC, Dr. Devan, who spent two, three years of a very productive postdoc here, Professor S.M. Deshpande, who is exp our expert on numerical analysis in CFD, and students here who are actually working with me. These are now, I mentioned their, their work as we go along. Going back to Amit Basu, who did some work more than 10 years ago and found uh, doing finance more profitable, so migrated from fluid dynamics. Well, here is what, um, um, I think we should take this quote off. I have to be careful here not to, maybe I should have stood on the other side. We talked a great deal about uh, cumulus clouds yesterday. Three clouds were mentioned. The cumulus congestus, and then the static form, and um, let's see, the third one was, uh, uh, what was the third one, huh? The tower. The tower, yes. The tower, the cumulus congestus, and the static form. Now, it turns out that in the experimental method that we have, and I will very briefly describe them, and I must incidentally apologize to many of my Indian friends here, especially Shevas, because they've heard part of this before. I hope that they will forgive me for uh, repeating this for those people who may not have known how we got around to this uh, problem. So, um, it turns out that we can actually reproduce all of those cloud forms in the apparatus that we have. Now, the key finding here after these experiments, for me, was to well, we can, we summarize by that statement. The cumulus flow is a transient diabetic plume. Transient because it's a finite lifetime, most of them. Diabetic because you have to put heat into it. And it is a plume. Now, um, after having looked at these pictures and all, all this work, it seems obvious. But it's actually not obvious when they started at all. Here is one movie. Let me see if it works, actually. No. Uh, let's see. Now I have to click here. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I need to go back.
Some of you have probably seen it. Uh, this is a, this is a, uh, this is actually real clouds, but fast forward. Uh, set of movies taken in Arizona, uh, Santa Catalina Mountains. You can, if you concentrate on any little cloud, you can see that some of them will actually disappear. Many of them will merge, and every now and then, one of them will shoot up spectacularly, and um, you know you, it, it can actually reach reach uh, very great heights. So, so what heights are the highest ones going to in the movie? In the movie, they're probably going up to 10 kilometers. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, that, that one. one. That one. That the one. The others were lower. Sure. Exactly right. Sure. Now, uh, if you look at the pictures of uh, the hurricanes, Katrina, for example, they go all the way beyond the tropopause. Yeah. This, of course, is not going. Okay. So that's basically what I wanted to show. I can switch this off now. So you take that movie and uh, watch each cloud and see what happens to it. You get this cloud lifetime distribution. You can see that the median is about 8 or 10 minutes. However, it's a very long tail, and uh, some of those clouds can be, you know, as well, even in that movie, they, they're about an hour long. Uh, you can make rough estimates of the flow unit for a cloud, your characteristic velocities of a few meters per second widths varying from 100 meters to kilometers. So you can see that quite a few of them are basically unsteady flows, the transient flows. The steady state is an exception rather than the rule. <coughs> um, the pictures that I showed you were made in an apparatus which is shown here. It's actually a water tank uh, about a meter square, one and a half meters high. Let's see. Let's see. Which is the one here? This one. Yeah. So that's a, that's a water tank, and um, uh, what we have here is that that's the flow. Uh, this is a plume chamber. You have active fluid. It's active fluid because it's electrically conducting. That's the way that we put heat into the fluid. Uh, it is water which is rendered electrically conducting by, add, by adding acid. Comes in through here, and uh, this is a plume chamber. You actually heat it up depending on what kind of temperature difference you want. And the plume rises through this flow plate through an orifice, that's O, and it goes through the set of electrodes. These electrodes, you can control the voltage on them. Uh, you can uh, change, therefore, the distribution and the history of the heating. They go through uh, an electrical circuit. Uh, variable voltage, etc. So you can at any time find out how much heat is being put in between any pair of electrodes. Uh, you need to do a little Kirchhoff law analysis to get that through. So that's the heat injection zone. That's where this flow as it comes out is subjected to heat. Then there is the rest of this. I can have a low level stratification here with a density difference here if we wanted to get uh, you know, something which approximates to a stratiform. And uh, high le upper level stratification here, which also incidentally, although it doesn't cool the cloud, it introduces a temperature differential which is the equivalent of cooling. Okay, so it stabilizes the city. So I can get a cloud to spread there if I wanted to. So these are the different things that are possible in the, in the setup. Um, may I ask, you have sure. weak stratification between these two layers? Which two? In, in the middle region. Here? Yes. No. There is no stratification no as of now at all. So that's very weak. It's, it's very, weak. very weak. You're quite no. right. It is very weak. Absolutely correct. It's very weak because uh, there is some which uh, leaks through from whatever we may do here. And uh, if you're making these experiments one after the other, you, you will have a little no, uh, from below. Stratification. But we think of it as largely in a neutral background. And if you want an atmospheric equivalent, we would say, uh, it's like the potential temperature being constant. Okay. So then, um, let's see, I can do this here. No. Now, this, uh, this sub subject of uh, what entrains, how, how the entrainment works in a cloud has been um, uh, discussed for quite a long time. Um, 
usually what we quickly find out is that classical ideas do not work. What do I mean by classical ideas? The most famous of them goes back to the 1950s and a paper by Martin Taylor and Turner. Uh, the basic assumption made was that the entrainment velocity, the fluid coming in here from the outside, from the ambient, is proportional to some characteristic velocity inside the flow. So VE is alpha, um, a constant times uh, UC, for example, if that's the center line velocity. And various other people have tried developments of this idea by replacing UC by the turbulence intensity, the fluxes, and so on. And it actually often works very well. That suggests an entrainment coefficient, which is uh, written down here, where M is the mass flow across the, um, along the flow here. Uh, Z is the vertical coordinate divided by rho is the density, approximately constant, the standard density here, a width of the flow, and a characteristic velocity inside the flow, right? like this uh, center line velocity, for example. So that's a non-dimensional entrainment coefficient. Uh, it comes from, uh, it goes back to Taylor's work, made incidentally to understand nuclear explosions, not clouds. So here have been uh, some of the many flow models that have been used at various times. Uh, among the first was just the thermal. It's a point, in an instantaneous point source of buoyancy. Release at some time t uh, equal to zero, and then that uh, the thermal rises there, and uh, Turner said that might be a cloud. But what he found was that uh, this angle at which the thermal moves out the envelope is pretty much the same as that for a steady plume. So at that time he drew the conclusion: so buoyancy really doesn't affect what happens in the flow. Well, I think uh, he did change his uh, view later on. He said one might be a starting plume. Um, some people have often used ideas as if it were a steady state plume. But uh, what we are suggesting here is that it's a transient plume. And uh, basically, um, this transient plume can, if you wanted, be converted to a thermal plume in one limit and a steady state plume in the other. The heat release is the key. You have to put in heat to simulate the heat release you have from... Uh, from condensation of water vapor. After a while, uh, there's no more heat release, and so it goes there, it becomes a ball, rather like this, and eventually it will sink and will die. Okay. And you can trace the complete life cycle of a cumulus flow in that apparatus. Uh, what makes this possible is the similarity parameter. This is all work which uh, was done with uh, but long ago. I'm just quickly going through it. Uh, if the heat release is the parameter, this is a, this is a non-dimensional form of that heat release parameter. Q is the amount of heat released. In a cloud, it's of the order of one watt per cubic meter. So in principle, if this was the similarity parameter, you should be able to reproduce a cloud flow in any fluid you like, provided you get the same value for G. It turns out that it's convenient to do it in water. We get the same kind of uh, parameters for this number, about 0.1 to 2, which is where the clouds are. But in order to do that, you have to put in 4 megawatts per cubic meter. But for small volumes, it's very manageable. So that's how the experiments are conducted. Okay, that you saw, but uh, the, actually the thing that I wanted to show you here is how the power put in varies with time. It shoots up, it comes down, and then shoots up again. And how it is distributed. In the early stages, when the cloud is still very shallow, you only have heat release down below here. And then as it rises uh, as a tower, uh, it is uh, distributed across uh, these electrodes and then eventually goes down as well. So by changing that uh, history, these two diagrams, we can make many different kinds of clouds. Here is a set of them, you know, some 20, uh, showing on the left, uh, the natural cloud, on the right the lab cloud, and you can see that there are many cumulus congestors. There is a cumulus fractus here, there is a cumulus mediocris here, and so on. So you can do four or five types. Okay, now, we now actually look at what happens uh, in that uh, same apparatus, in the similar apparatus. Uh, if you put heat into, let's say, a plume. Uh, this is a plume moving up there, uh, it's a laser slice, uh, 
So you have a flow visualization with one of these usual dice that fluoresce at the right frequencies. And you can see that up to this point, this is actually slightly misplaced. Up to about this point, where there's no heat release, this is a canonical classical plume. Steady degrading. After you start putting in heat, the structure of that uh, thing, internal structure, clearly changes. Uh, and the change is not small, it is dramatic. Uh, the most dramatic change is that here, you have a lot of ambient fluid in there. Those dark patches are ambient fluid. In fact, you even have a hole. That's one reason why I like this diagram. Uh, in this plume, there's actually a hole. Uh, the ambient fluid can actually go all the way across here. Um, but, once you put in the heat, two things happen. All these uh, curly cues disappear. Uh, this actually looks more mixed, more nearly homogeneous. Okay. So, it is strange. Um, from one point of view, this outer fluid is not getting into the middle here as it is getting here without the heating. But at the same time, actually because of it, because there is no diluting ambient fluid coming in, there is more mixedness here. So from one point of view, you can say, well, there is a mixedness transition here from, uh, from not so mixed to well mixed within. Could you say what the Reynolds number is uh, roughly? Um, roughly a few thousands. Uh, typically 2,000, some uh, up to 3,000, some at 1,000. This is a relatively lower than or something. A quick summary of what you find, however. Uh, here is plotted the reciprocal of the center line velocity okay. versus distance or height. Uh, heating is there in that region. And you can see that that's a straight line, just exactly as classical similarity theory demands. And there's no heating. But when you put this additional heating, uh, this curve comes down, which is uh, basically saying that the central line velocity is going up. Fluid is accelerating. In fact, towards the end, the fluid is actually accelerating a little bit. This is about the thickness. Once again, uh, you would normally expect in a standard canonical jet that the width of the jet uh, increases linearly with distance, which is what it's doing with no heating. But as you put in the heat, the width decreases. And if you plot the decrease in heat versus this parameter G, you can see that they sort of collapse. Which incidentally is an indication that at least for the large scale structure of the flow, G is a relevant parameter. The others have to do with turbulence intensity, but I think I will uh, skip that and um, come back. Here is another laser thing showing you what the difference is. That is the no, no, no heating. The standard plume. This is the plume with the heating. And if you take cross sections, here is the cross section of the standard plume. Once again, you can see that there is fluid all the way from inside. And here, from the heated plume, and you can see that there is a core there, which is, uh, which is actually very well mixed. They have something to do with what um, people who look at clubs have often found and call it a protected core. You know, so something there which is highly mixed. Concentrations, water droplet concentrations, for example, remain constant across. Yes? Can you say again exactly what we're looking at here? We are looking at the dye concentration. The dye concentration. Yeah. So it's a scalar field. It is the dye which makes the picture possible, like a rhodamine, for example. The temperature differences are a few degrees centigrade. And I think one of um, Bach's students looked at possible errors there. Uh, do you want to answer that question, Kiran Mai's work and so on, which looked at uh, what, what these problems were? A few degrees. A few degrees is the temperature difference. That's all. It's, it's a, actually, it doesn't take much temperature difference. That's actually one of the problems, because measuring accurate, the temperature accurately is not easy, simultaneously. Yeah. Yes? So, so the Schmidt number of the die is That is large, true. Though. That's true. That's quite Schmidt true. Yes, yes. That's you are not, absolutely right. That's not. No. So that's why you, you are absolutely correct. So that's why these are only to trigger thinking. These are not the actual measurement. Okay. Okay. How does uh, turbulent entrainment occur? Well, the correct understanding, which goes back to 
work done by Brown and Rothbard mixing layers, is uh, that basically it consists of three stages. First, there's engulfment. That's to say, um, the larger these, the coherent structures in the flow, get fluid from the outside, suck it in, induce it inwards, and uh, they bring ambient, non-turbulent air, or in a cloud, dry air, into the moist air between the cloud. There's a second stage which people call stirring, uh, uh, mingling. Uh, here, the stirring action brings them, you know, it, uh, as you saw in that plume, in the canonical plume, it brings the outer fluid and the fluid in the core, it makes the interfaces very convoluted, fractals um, of some kind. <clears throat> and the area of contact between the, the outer fluid, the, the ambient fluid and the core fluid increases enormously. Finally, there's actually the action of molecular diffusion and the mingled fluid becomes turbulent. That's to say, dry air is converted into saturated cloudy air in a real cloud. In this, um, in this experiment, in this kind of uh, experiment, um, that's what leads to the mixed state that we often see in these clouds. <clears throat> now, using uh, particle image velocimetry, we can actually measure the mass flow as uh, the flow rises, and uh, from there you can uh, see the rate at which the mass flow is changing. Therefore, you can go back and compute the entrainment coefficient. Okay. Now, you, this, is, this is one, one shot. I mean, uh, you, you make a whole velocity field measurement. So, from that one shot, you can actually compute whether things are raising. This is a steady state flow, though. <coughs> And as you see here, which space, this is all after the heating. The heating is uh, behind here. So this is Z. And this is the entrainment coefficient. The unheated is a red curve. And you can see the large fluctuations uh, in space. However, you can drive a mean line through it. And that mean line is what the textbooks usually call. It's very close. It's very close to the standard value uh, for the entrainment coefficient. Uh, for this flow. Once you put in the heat, that also fluctuates a great deal as you can see here, but there is no question that the mean after, after the heating is actually considerably lower. So we put all the data together here. Now there have been uh, many experiments, uh, apart from the ones in Bangalore, there are uh, two others as well in the United States. Now they don't all collapse on one curve. But they roughly behave the same way. Uh, there's this one experiment where uh, it stands out a little bit more. Everything is higher. And uh, I don't understand exactly why that is so. But it may be that the total length of the heating zone there was uh, smaller than what we had used in relation to the diameter of the flow. But the other ones, by and large, agree that it starts out here like a classical plume at first and increases. The, the entrainment coefficient increases a little bit, reaches some maximum, and then drops towards the end of the heat injection zone, um, suddenly goes to zero, and it can even go to negative values. Okay. It can vary a great deal. Here is a... Sorry? It goes to negative values, you, you hit a, make a stratiform cloud. It could be so exactly right. That's it could a it, 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 they can be detrained. That's right. They can be detrained. Actually, it doesn't even have to go to the static form. Uh, if you have a plume head, you know, cauliflower type, the big one, that's like right, yeah, it's already detraining there. I show you. I show you exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I show yeah. measurements of exa that in a, in a few minutes. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Here's the comparison with a large eddy simulation made by Romson Kwong, uh, where they introduce a variable called purity. Uh, the idea of purity is the following. You take whatever fluid is coming in at cloud base as 100% pure. And then as the fluid rises, there is ambient fluid in, it dilutes it, and so you, you make a ratio which is such that it's one at cloud base, and as you go up, the more and more um, uh, ambient fluid, therefore it dilutes and the purity goes down. Okay, that's the idea. 
Now, uh, the simulation showed this. It starts with a purity of 1 at cloud base, which is around 2 kilometers. And then it uh, decreases. Um, concentrations. Now, if you actually draw mean lines there, you can see what it is here. Uh, they use different resolutions. Between the different resolutions, that's a spread in their simulation data. And uh, you can see that, that there's, in fact, very good agreement between uh, the purity here and the purity seen here. Uh, one good thing is that we can see where, you see, there's a kind of a knee. For example, in this curve, there's a knee there, there's a knee there. What that's saying is that at that level, all water vapor has condensed. Okay? So there's no more heat release. And when that happens, this sort of uh, straightens out a little bit. There's a weak knee. As a matter of fact, what's happening here is glaciation, a second phase change. Yes. Is that based on some observation rounds and uh, No, no, no. It's a larger dissimulation. Okay. It's a larger dissimulation. No. So, in a way, you can think of the conclusion from here is that that larger dissimulation is all the thermodynamics in some sense put in. And this measurement with just heat being put in, well, they're roughly in agreement. Okay, here is a picture that emerges from, from this work. Um, for the cloud is a very complex flow. Uh, there's a lot of uh, microphysics, thermodynamics, and so on. But one way to look at it is that all of that, although it's coupled to the fluid dynamics, even on the large scale here, it leads to phase transition, and therefore heat release. Heat release is there, and that heat release has an immediate and dramatic effect on the large scale dynamics, on the cloud scale dynamics of the flow, large structures. Okay. And I want to show that a large part of it is uh, described by Navier Stokes in the Boosnesk approximation. But of course, the real cloud, this is coupled with this as well. Now, what we have investigated is this box. You can see this is a fluid dynamics box there. And it has to be coupled to the rest of it. So to the extent that heat release is under your control, this system is not closed yet. But uh, we are working on that, and we hope that, in fact, we should have something where, where, where uh, this, this box, at least, will, in fact, be closed. And uh, we hope that we'll have some simulations before long. Okay. So that is the key thing. So now I want to show quickly some uh, PIV measurements on a transient flow. We've said it's a transient flow. But what happens in a transient flow in terms of uh, measurements? That's the experimental setup. So it's more or less the same as before. Here are the entrainment coefficients, or the mass flow ratios, actually. Um, this is the mass flow divided by Yeah, divided by uh, the mass flow through the uh, coming in through the orifice. So the M over M naught it starts from one here. This is at different times. Uh, so this is at uh, seven and a half seconds in the experiment as the flow is rising. In fact, I should have shown you a movie of that earlier. But anyway, come there. So you, you imagine a transient flow now. So as it's rising, at each instant. You can actually map the whole velocity field uh, by PIV techniques. And therefore, you can immediately calculate the way that the mass flow is changing. You can therefore, at each instant, compute what the mass flow is. And therefore, also what the entrainment coefficient is. <coughs> so that's the way it goes. Uh, this is unheated. So that's where the mass flow is. And uh, as you keep putting in the heat, uh, as it goes through the heat injection zone, you can see that it changes a great deal and comes down. So there's a lot of variation here. Uh, the heated thing is here. Now here it looks a little confused. That's because all the variables are varying at the same time. If you look at the mass flux, the entrainment coefficient, now the mass flux ratio, if you look at uh, any one of those, 
uh, at z by d at one given time t equals 12 seconds. There are once again these large fluctuations. But the trend seems quite clear. It uh, reaches a maximum value and then drops off. It is a little hard to uh, define a central line velocity for a transient plume, so there are some uncertainties. So don't take these as anything very accurate. If you wanted to get accurate values here, you have to do an ensemble average. And uh, that, in fact, we will do before long. Here is the entrainment coefficient. This uh, blue thing is what you saw in the previous slide as unheated. Well, uh, this goes back to your question. In this unheated, and even in this unheated jet, transient jet, uh, the entrainment coefficient is uh, positive up to some stage and then negative beyond that. It's a jet. But isn't that feeling the stable stratification of the layer above? It, uh, I, I don't think it's actually that. It's not yet. That, that stable stratification is still far away in this case. Too far away still. Yeah. But it's not hitting a level of neutral buoyancy because it's unstratified. And it's spreading somehow because the divergence. No, no, actually, sorry. That, so that's a I, I mistake. I should actually have shown you the picture that this corresponds to. This picture corresponds to the very first picture I showed you. Namely, it rises and there's a bulbous head. It's a cumulus congestus kind of uh, situation. This is happening towards the head of that thing. Happening on the head. Okay. Now, uh, now, when you put in the heat, you see it goes there. It actually becomes negative, goes positive, and then goes negative again. <laughs> okay. No, I was just saying, the variation is, uh, is quite complicated. It goes negative, goes positive, and goes negative once again. So we have to understand what may be leading to this sort of uh, behavior. But uh, let's see what's happening to the standard value for the entrainment coefficient from the classical jet. On this transient flow, it's not in the picture. It's not in the picture at all. Okay. So the old uh, similarity theories uh, do not capture uh, the basic features of what happens in these transient flows. Okay tentative conclusions here. So we have, a, have an apparatus where we can simulate a complete life cycle, although I've not actually shown it in great detail here, but there's a movie which uh, we can see later on if you want. We can measure the entrainment coefficient and transient flows. There are large statistical fluctuations and we really have to make an ensemble average in order to get uh, information of value in uh, modeling, for example. But if you do that, there may be, uh, there may be some ideas here which could lead to better cumulus parameterization schemes. But as far as the fundamentals are concerned, it's already clear. As far as I know, no cumulus parameterization model looks at heating as a variable. Whereas here, its history and its profile have an enormous influence. Not small, big. It's a big influence. Okay. So we are trying to now to compute that cloud. This is, this is the kind of cloud that we have actually, the kind of flow in which we have actually made these transient measurements. Now this actually goes back to older work and I want briefly to go into that because uh, some of the concepts that uh, are useful came out of here. Uh, this is a temporal simulation of a cloud-like flow, box, periodic boundary conditions. It has one big disadvantage, namely that the net entrainment will be zero because of periodic boundary conditions. But it has the advantage at that time we couldn't do anything very much uh, bigger. It had the advantage that with uh, whatever computers we had, we could actually go ahead and compute and get the water state field, take a close look at the water state field. That was possible because of the parallel computer at that time at uh, NL. So that's what happens. That is the real flow. 
going through this heating. The wind that's uh, solved is this box where this jet actually spreads in time, but it's homogeneous in this direction. It's homogeneous in this direction, but it's temporal, so it spreads laterally in time. Those are the equations. Conservation of mass, momentum. Um, here is the buoyancy term. Uh, that makes uh, the big difference to the momentum balance. And here is the diabatic term, heat addition in the temperature equation. So we just solve these three equations, pseudo-spectral method, periodic boundary conditions in the flow. <coughs> now, let's look at the baroclinic talk. The suggestion I want to make is that if you wanted to understand this as mechanics, the baroclinic talk seems to me to hold the key. And I, I'll explain to you briefly why, why I believe so. Um, <clears throat> so in this flow, this is the warm fluid within the jet, cold fluid outside. So the temperature gradient has this direction, inwards. It's higher in the center than outside. Now the main baroclinic torque is just proportional to G cross gravity, cross product of the acceleration due to gravity, so that's vertically downwards. So this G cross grad T into paper and out of paper, it is actually azimuthal. So there's an azimuthal torque because of that temperature gradient. What is the sign of that azimuthal torque? It is such that it accelerates the flow inside, which is what we observe, or it is shear enhancing. It is mean vorticity enhancing because it uh, accelerates the thing. Of course. Uh, it it uh, pushes the velocity down on the edges. So it's, it sort of tends to concentrate the flow. That is why the flow actually shrinks. <clears throat> so suppose you didn't heat the flow. I, these are uh, vorticity contours, chiefly azimuthal vorticity contours. Uh, then we have the same similar analysis for other components too, but uh, a lot of them in the azimuthal vorticity. Here is a coherent structure in that jet. And this is roughly like what people have measured in the lab. But we now can uh, look at the vorticity field within that structure. The instantaneous vorticity field is very easy to measure in the lab. And you can see that there is azimuthal vorticity there and there. It could be a ring. If it, if it were a ring, that's what you would get here. And there is some azimuthal vorticity on uh, the sides here, not much inside. So this vorticity field is, uh, I think it's like a turban. There's a ring there and, and a sheet there, relatively pointed at the top, but inside it's not, not, the vorticity is not very strong. Now you add heat, you see the enormous effect it has. Enormous. Dramatic and enormous. Now two, three things have happened here. First of all, you can't recognize such structures anymore uh, easily. But if you look at it, if you stare at it, then you begin to see what's happened. See, um, here is one of the structures which is uh, penetrating, an older structure which is there. So what's happened to those structures is that first of all they're stretched out, acceleration, the squashed, baroclinic talk, and then an enormous amount of fine scale vorticity has been produced, an enormous amount. That's what leads to, uh, that, that's what may lead to uh, the higher mixing. It's also characteristic of these flows. So uh, this sort of reconciles the behavior as due to the baroclinic top. It enhances it, it enhances the vorticity, uh, especially fine scale, as in fact you can see from the spectra here. Okay, this is the cross section. Uh, I do not worry too much about the cross section. This is the mean square vorticity. I think that my conclusion is best shown here. The spectrum. This is the spectrum of the entropy. Turbulent entropy, entropy. And, um, you know, the, the full line is the unheated thing. And the dotted line is the heated thing. And this is a logarithmic scale. This is a logarithmic scale as well. Uh, let's just look at the azimuthal, 
even at uh, kz about a one here, there is an order of magnitude difference in the spectrum, even on the large scale vorticity. But when you come to this, the fine scale vorticity, it is several orders of magnitude, thousand. So the entropy at uh, the high frequencies is thousand times the entropy increase at low frequencies. So that's uh, that, of course, is what the visual message conveyed in those pictures was. Okay, now this is a, this is a temporal simulation, so it's not a heating box, but a heating interval, okay. so in time. So that about corresponds to what you saw in the box. There is there are temporal equivalents of what you saw in that box. So it would be g of r of one. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't get it. So, so there's a, there's an end scale on which you heat the heat that corresponds. That's true. Which is the width of the flow. Ah, ha, ha, I see. Well, yeah, okay. So that's, yes, the length scale is the width of the flow at that time. Yeah. Sorry? It, it's time because this is a temporal evolution, but it's homogeneous in Z. So you average at all Zs, at all values of Z, so you get relatively smooth spectrum. Sorry? Oh, I was just going to ask a similar question to Olivier. Do you think from non-dimensional analysis of the nature of the heating, you would get the magnitude? depending on the heating strength and its duration, you could make a, a, a good, yeah. non simple non-dimensional scaling yes, right. argument for the magnitude. Yes. And have you done that? Uh, not exactly in the sense in which I think you are asking the question. But I think what you are saying is that, uh, well, as far as... Uh, if, if we had very weak differential heating, yeah. you wouldn't expect yeah, you a would very not. big jump. You would not. You would not. Increased lung True, true, true. So, so we roughly know how it changes with the heating. Um, well, for example, I had a slide there showing how the width, the reduction in width, goes like g to the half. That kind of argument is there. So, uh, but uh, I'm not showing you all the results we have. I'm just showing those which. Um, um, well, my time is running out actually. So, I'm, I'm just showing those where. Uh, we've, we've, it's led to these uh, conclusions that I'm stating. Okay, now. Okay, now we've been computing these flows now. I have some very preliminary results. So, this is now, this is now not uh, sort of spectral and uh, periodic conditions and so on. It's an actual uh, thing developing in X and T. In space and time, it's a transient flow developing in space and time. So here is, um, well, here is the one that just recently is being simulated. This is a computer picture now. This is not, uh, this is not uh, a laboratory picture. And um, close enough, three more minutes. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm just uh, trying to show you that it's actually, yes. Is this the LDS or DNS? No, DNS. This is a complete DNS, no other model, no other assumption. It's strictly DNS. Huh? Thousand. Huh? Two thousand. Two thousand. Roughly the same as in the lab. I'll show you one picture about what Reynolds number is. Anyway, I think these are just, um, just things are going on now, so these are very preliminary results. These are the same equations that you saw before except that we have included one passive scale. That is the vorticity equation. Now, okay, let me skip all of that. So we have done some simulations with 4 million grid points, which is still actually inadequate for even this low Reynolds number. But uh, it gives us different kinds of flows. You can play around with them. And here is an entrainment coefficient as well. But that's not the thing that I want. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Here is the vorticity component uh, from the solution, okay? Heated and heated. Once again, you can see what the dramatic difference is between the heated and the unheated. That's the heat injection zone. Thins down, and you can see that the vorticity is huge compared to what it was here on the fine scale thing. 
just wanted to argue about the vote to sleep budget. Last point I want to make. Um, here is uh, how the mean vote city changes. Okay, so, so um, basically I think it helps to look at the vote city budget. So if, you, if it um, helps to look at the vote city budget, here is what it is for the mean vote city. Capital Omega is the mean vote city. These primes are fluctuating vote seas, turbulent transport of turbulent vote city, etc. And it turns out that the viscous diffusion is not very important. And uh, one of the largest terms here is really this. Now, you recall what the flow does as you put in the heat, stretches it out, squashes it on the lateral side, and crumples it inside into high frequency. So, how does that happen? Here is the equation. Now, unfortunately, this equation looks absolutely formidable. This is an equation for the fluctuating entropy, the turbulent entropy, derived by the usual uh, uh, methods from the equation for the turbulent component of the velocity. You have all these terms, generation by mean velocity gradient, mean vorticity gradient, turbulent transport, stretching, stretching by turbulent strain, viscous diffusion, viscous dissipation. I have no time to go into an analysis of those. But it turns out, by a very happy and fortunate circumstance, that in the limit of large Reynolds numbers, the only terms that matter here are these two. The stretching of the vorticity by turbulent strain and the viscous dissipation. Now, so it actually simplifies. It simplifies enormously. The vorticity budget is far simpler than the energy budget. And the reason for that is that the turbulent vorticity does not scale with outer variables, does not scale with the large scale variables. It is much larger, even in simple homogeneous turbulence. The turbulent vorticity goes by the turbulent velocity fluctuation divided by the Taylor microscale, not by the large scale. It's larger, the factor of R to the half. So when you put those arguments in, it turns out that only two terms survive. And if I put in the heat also, this is a simple equation for the turbulent entropy. Stretching by itself, viscous dissipation, and the baroclinic torque. This is under control. This is actually a dominant term. That really is what leads to, okay, there's some more argument about how big it is. So maybe this kind of crinkling which you see on a cumulus cloud is some signature of that very high frequency, fine scale vorticity that's being generated by the fluctuating baroclinic torque. Okay. Well, that's uh, torque distribution. I, I skip that. This is the last thing. Suppose you wanted to do a very meaningful simulation, DNS, without introducing any models. You would like to do it at a much higher Reynolds number. If you go back, there is actually a mixing transition in these flows around 10,000. I would love to be able to do it somewhere here, 15,000. How much time do you need? Depends on what kind of computer you have. That's a teraflop computer. That is, of course, if you look at uh, the days here, um, computer time in days, log logarithm of that. So we are talking about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3 days, out of the question. Now, if you have a petaflop computer, which people are talking about, uh, around here, you are talking about 10 to the power 1 and 10 to the power 2 days. Even that is quite a lot. But but if you had a petaflop computer for about a week, you'll actually be able to get some results. You should get the mixing right. These other things don't still get the mixing right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and the, the only word of caution I would have is that uh, clouds do not heat, they heat when they move. So it's a little bit different setup than that, that what you have. And, and we have to keep this in mind. You don't heat the cloud in a given space, but rather as the air moves up, then it's being heated. So, so there are some 
I believe that there are some similarities. Yeah, but, this is an issue. But physically, it's different. Yeah. And actually, when you go to your DNS simulations, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. actually include that in a very simple way, rather mm -hmm. than heat it locally, mm -hmm. using equations that we solve when we simulate clouds. So you mean putting the thermodynamics in? Is that no. what you mean? For example, or just the simplest approach would be to make a heating that depends on vertical velocity, because that's what happens in a cloud. Well, your, your condensation rate depends on a vertical velocity, so that's the very simplest okay, way then you can uh, you, you bring in a fudge factor there. No, it's not a fudge ah. factor. That's how clouds work. Well. That's how cloud droplets work. <laughs> no, that may, uh, maybe how clouds work, but uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. That's, how, that, that's, that's the physics of clouds. That's how clouds work. Locally, your condensation rate depends on the, on the vertical velocity. That's what I'm velocity. saying. I'm talking about thermodynamics. So that, that is something which we're actually right now doing. So we have a student, Rama is here who is actually doing, uh, putting the thermodynamics and the fluid dynamics together. So that should automatically take account of this factor. Is so what I'm thinking. So yes. I have actually a similar comment, okay. but it's a different, more mathematical one. Mm -hmm. So you wrote down that place where you want to do a closure of the boost and S with your feedback. Yeah. And some of us have already worked on these type of closures, and they're exactly in, in uh, Wojtek's comment is exactly relevant. They're called weak temperature gradient approximation closures. We've had them operating with multi-scale asymptotics on scales of one kilometer to 10 kilometers per cloud. And in fact, what Wojtek says in those weak temperature gradients, they, the heating is directly related to the vertical velocity and couples the fluid dynamics and they're systematically derived. And they do the closure and I would say they're intermediate between the complexity that Wojtek is talking about with full cloud microphysics and what you're doing in laboratory. So they're imposed heatings that systematically, nonlinearly interact with the fluid, fluid mechanics outside. They're called weak temperature gradient ones. Sam Steckman has papers on it. I have papers on it. Okay. We have papers together on it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and, and this is for the students a fascinating thing to say yeah. because there are some very nice problems to do that are intermediate between yeah. full complexity, yeah. cloud physics, and uh, the, the laboratory experiments, and oh. I believe would make a nice yeah. link. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure about uh, what you say. But uh, for example, after all these closure models, can you say what the entrainment is going to be? I'm sorry. Can you say what the entrainment is going no, to be? No, but you can oh. write down the. No, why is that? We write down a systematic closure yeah. equation derived from multi-scale asymptotics, and we explore by similar numerical experiments, DNSs, how plumes behave. We're interested in statistical arrays of plumes, so we didn't ask sure. the one plume sure. question, yeah. except I have some <coughs> academic examples of one plume, which can make congestive clouds or stratified I'm sorry, clouds. I have to read it. Have to. That's why I didn't speak it. <laughs> Okay. Really, we will have to close here. <laughs> yeah. It has triggered a lot of interesting discussion. Fortunately, we have a tea yeah. break. Yeah. So we will continue <laughs> there. Sorry. <laughs>